Hi everyone, this is Wednesday, January 23rd, and I'm finally making my video about uh, my trip to Idaho. I want to first start with something from Father's Words. This is Chun Sung Young, page 1065, on the right side, bottom um, paragraph. Why do people like things of a higher level? They like high places because there they can connect to a variety of things. Why don't they like low places? It's because people become restricted in low places, far away from wider relationships. For human beings, the most precious person of all is the person who is trying to connect to higher ideals, perspectives, and issues. From this we can realize that such a person is a precious person. That's from the 129th uh, volume, page 308, given in 1983. And uh, I definitely had experience of being around some higher higher people there. It was great. Let me see. Before I forget, I want to tell you about a recipe that someone told me. If you have a cold or you feel a cold coming on, you take empty capsules. You can get them at a drugstore. You put in six drops of oregano. That's what it smells like. I mean, it smells just like oregano. Time. Oops. Time. Twelve drops of peppermint. Six drops of lemon. I have citrus fresh, which has lemon in it. I ran out of lemon. And also six drops of frankincense. That will fill two capsules. You take those 12 hours apart, three doses, and it just knocks the cold out. So that's a little little thing there. I also picked up this one. It's called Deep Relief. This is a roll-on, okay? Those other ones, you just take off the cap. You drop it out of the bottle like that. There's a little teeny hole. Roll-ons are just like a roll-on. You just rub it on your, you know, your skin or whatever. This is like Bengay in a bottle, except it's all natural. And it smells really good. So, the title of my talk is Running Around in Circles and Picking Up Sticks. What it takes to make essential oils is really quite amazing, as I was saying earlier. What you got to do is you, you plant a tree. You wait 10 years. You cut it down. And... Uh, they were they had them planted in rows, of course, so they're fairly close together, maybe maybe eight feet apart or so, and the trees are about six six feet apart in each row. So what they would do is uh, sometimes they could go in with a little um, this cutter machine and cut it at the base, and this clamp goes on and lifts it and pulls it out of the row. Other times they would go in with a chainsaw and cut it; it would kind of lay backwards. Then they'd take in a team of two horses. Take the horses in. These are, and these are like, I'm five, six. The back of the horses was up to here. They were massive, called Percherons, like the Budweiser horses, but maybe bigger. Um, take them in, and they actually have to turn them around, and then they have a, a wire thing on the back. They, they hook it around the log, around the tree, and they haul them out of that particular row. Pretty amazing to watch. And um, then they drag them over to this yard where they lay all the trees down. They have these chippers that um, the slower chipper took maybe a minute to to chip up a um, you know twenty foot tree or something. I saw a faster one that was incredible. It was ten seconds, literally ten seconds. The tree just went in, and then the chips are flying into the back of a truck. Then they load up the truck, and then they take those uh, two and a half hours down south to a place called St. Mary's and uh, then they are ready to be distilled. So um, after they're, they're distilled, then they have to truck them down to Utah, which is, I don't know how far. They, they put them in these big barrels, and uh, they test each batch, and then they bottle it and ship it out to the world. So the, um, the distilling is actually a 10-stage process. You have to have the exact temperature, usually around 200 degrees for balsam fir. So for four hours, it needs to be right at 200 degrees. And the pressure has to be exactly right. Um, they go the the wood chips go into this big cooker. If you look at that video I posted about Idaho balls, um, no, about Idaho blue spruce, that little four minute video with the music, um, I think that showed you've got these big. It's, it's like a big pressure cooker. It's about eight feet across and about twelve feet deep, so it's pretty massive. And so the when the truck comes with the with the wood chips. 
um, they have this conve conveyor belt along the inside of the truck and then people have to go in and you use pitchforks and you help get all the chips out basically onto the ground. Then the little bulldozer comes and picks up a load and dumps it into the cooker. So um, they'll load it, they'll fill it up maybe four feet or so, then people jump down in there and you use a, a pitchfork again to kind of smooth it out. And then the running around in circles part is where you're you're running around and pressing everything down because the more compacted it is, the more chips can go in and the more um, uh, the more it stays together as it comes out of the cooker. So and we had to really kind of push with our feet against the edge all the way around. The picking up sticks part was after the horses bring the the tree out of the row, they some branches get broken off. So then people go back through and then pick up the extra branches and the needles to be able to distill as much of the as much of the wood as possible. So um so it it was kinda um it was kind of fun when the when the bulldozer would come and it, and put more chips in when we're inside the cooker. We, you know, you just have to close your eyes like that, and then they dump it on, and you're getting all, all all dusty and sweaty and stuff. But it's really fun. And then you run around, and then so you you fill up all the way up to the top, and that weighs uh, about five thousand pounds. Then then when the steam goes in there from the bottom, uh, by the time it's done, it weighs uh, 10,000 pounds. So because of the weight of all the steam in the water, and if if you don't do the right temperature and the right pressure, the the oil will stay in the wood, and then you don't get as much volume of oil as you want. Now, if one of those batches actually fails, like I mean, I don't know, something happens and the whole thing is lost. It's actually $21,000 that the company is losing just for that one. Um, cooker worth of chips. So they're very serious. It actually takes five years to become uh, truly expert at the distilling process. And um, so one guy that was there, his name was uh, Geraldo, I think. And Colleen uh, lived in Uruguay for 20 years. She speaks Spanish fluently. So she was helping him since he was brand new actually to the whole thing, uh, helping to translate. So that was nice. And um, happened to be with our group a bunch of Japanese came over there were seven women came over from Japan and one translator so uh, it felt just like being with church members it was so it was just so comfortable for me I, you know making jokes with them and chatting with them and this and that so uh, it's pretty good when we got there they said we we settled in the first day and then they said okay each we're gonna have two groups of 12 hour shifts now we didn't know that we were gonna have 12 hour shifts of work and then they said one has to do the day shift and one has to take the night shift and we're thinking oh my goodness <laughs> someone will have to take the night shift so because of the time change the Japanese group ended up taking that and we took the day shift so we helped press down the chips and then when they're all done distilling a crane lifts up the whole mass and then moves it outside dumps it in a truck and then they use those chips as mulch and they actually save the water that was used in distilling and uh, gather them in these huge containers maybe 15 feet long four feet wide plastic containers about four feet high and then you can use that water into put it into a hot tub so we were soaking in this water from the balsam fir the smell was just incredible and that's I think why my husband said my skin is feeling smooth because I we had um, two chances to soak in the balsam water so anyway then um, then when you're, when they're getting ready to put a different plant in say you're going from balsam fir to um, to blue spruce you want to clean yeah, they have to clean the tank out completely so I asked Gary well how do you clean it out uh, Gary Young was there and he said um, we fill it with some water dump in a box of Tide and um, and then st uh, steam that for four hours to clean out all the all the equipment and we said why do you use Tide he said because it's cheap <laughs> so that was kind of funny he said that say you finished distilling balsam fir you could just clean it out. You sweep it out um, after everything is done. You sweep the sides and the bottom. I do have a um, a slight war wound. You see that right there? Ooh, yeah, see that right there? That was a burn I got from between my glove and my coat. I was uh, it was hot after when we were cleaning it out, and I touched one of the metal parts by mistake. So that's my um, 
that was my little bit of pain there. But he said that uh, they could put in a load of lavender, for example. They could distill it. They could you know, bottle it, ship it out. No one would know the difference, but actually he would know the difference. So he's so serious to keep the, you know, the lavender oil is just lavender oil is nothing else. The balsam fir is just balsam for nothing else because his reputation is on the line. If young leaders claiming to be the world leader in essential oils, then you've got to do everything right. So um, uh, it takes about 150 trees to make 12 gallons of oil. Doesn't sound like a lot, right? And from one cooker's worth of the uh, the the 5,000 pounds of chips on a good day with a good batch, they will get seven quarts. That's all. So it is really a massive effort to grow and harvest everything, transport it, distill it. Um, you know, you got the workers, the trucks, the maintenance, all of that. Um, it's a really a lot of labor, and they don't really have that many employees there. Okay, and it takes 58 gallons per minute of fuel to run this massive boiler. They got a new boiler this year. It's probably 10 feet long and 8 feet high, and this, it's this big cylinder. Um, so there's a lot of expense that goes into it. They take it down to Utah. Each batch gets tested, gets bottled, and labeled, and sent out. So I asked Gary, um, how much of the Young Living products does Young Living actually make? And he said that Young Living only deals with the liquids directly. So of all the oils that are produced, 70% are grown by Young Living, grown and distilled, you know, the seed to seal process by Young Living. Another 30% are from farms that they contract out um, to their specifications. So it has to be organic. The soil is tested. Everything has to be just right so that they're getting the highest uh, quality, which will be therapeutic for for the human body and for animals. You can use oils on animals. There's all kinds of vets that use them too. Um, and then the other products are made in other places, like the um, you have uh, capsules and powders and face cream and shampoo, toothpaste, all that stuff is made in in other locations. Um, one thing that was interesting, he said that people think you can't regenerate um, cartilage, for example, but Balsam fur can regenerate cartilage, so if anyone's got you know grinding knees or hips or something, that might be something really good to try. They are buying more farmland. Uh, there's a distillery in Spain being built right now, and I I heard that I thought well that's kind of funny because there's no farm in Spain, and then the the leader of farm operations worldwide was there. He's Gary Young's brother-in-law, and he said. There will be farms there. So they're definitely expanding. They hope to be a billion dollar company this year. And um, let me see. Yeah, it, it just Gary Young reminded me so much of True Father. He has an absolute passion for what he does, works very hard. He's most comfortable right out there, um, you know, cutting down the trees. Like Father loved being in nature, loved being on the ocean. Gary's very much the same way. He wants to be leading the horses. Pulling the trees, um, getting them ready for the chipper and all that. He just loves being out there. He started as a um, a logger in Canada, had a massive logging accident where a log fell on him, uh, cracked his skull into three places, shattered his whole shoulder blade, uh, compressed and broke a bunch of his dicks in his vertebra and all that, and he was um, paralyzed for a while. Now he's very, very healthy. So the the uh, the accommodations were very nice. Cabins were warm and clean. Um, we had brought sleeping bags, but it turned out we didn't even really need to use them that much. Um, so Colleen and I got to go to both of the farms, and that was great. And um, and there were some people there that were really high leadership levels, very approachable, very friendly. And uh, from the moment we landed, you know, in the plane, we were getting information, sharing recipes, sharing ideas, sharing resources. Um, and that was that was fun and that was very valuable. He said that um, some of the oils that help with personal transformation, if we're trying to grow, we're trying to get unstuck from certain patterns or whatever, um, highest potential is a good one. Sacred Mountain, acceptance, frankincense, motivation, um, and abundance. You can wear the oil just, you know, like perfume. You can put it on your chakra points, do different things. He said that um, forgiveness is a very, very important part of 
being able to go to the next level. And so you can put the oil of forgiveness, that's a blend, put it right on your um, in your belly button and stay what you're forgiving yourself for and you, you put it on in, in um, counter, no, clockwise circles. Yeah, clockwise circles. So that is um, some of the main stuff that uh, that we did when we were there. It was just a really neat experience. You can see there's a lot of work that goes into this. And um, I trust the intentions of the people that I met uh, and had a really good time. I connected with people that I had seen at convention. Actually, one of the Japanese ladies remembered me from convention because I had said, oh, how goes I was or something to her <laughs> last June. And there she was in Idaho. And... Um, there, this was something interesting. Uh, you know, we want to represent God wherever we go. Sometimes I get a feeling that I want to sh share something with someone. And among the Japanese group, there were four uh, women were married and three were not. The three that were not married were all in their 40s. And I just felt really sad about this. And so the last night before they left, I took a chance to say something. I asked the translator, um, is it okay if I talk? To everyone for a few minutes and they all he said yes and they all said yes so I asked the ones that were the ones that were not married if they really want to be married and they said they did um, and I said well maybe you need to use you need to do something to shift your energy so that maybe you can find that husband or that person can come to you um, because we're meant to share our life with a partner and that's God's plan from the beginning. So um, uh, so I said, maybe you can use the oil of abundance, for example, and, and focus on what you need to do to shift your energy or perhaps be more feminine or, or do something different so that um, so that you can find that person, attract that person into your life. And they, they really appreciated that. I told them that just simple teachings of Father, like, you know, life, um, in water uh, is in the womb, life on the earth is life in the air, and then in the spirit world we breathe the air of love. So the purpose of our life on earth is to grow our heart of love for other people, have lots of give and take, lots of relationships, lots of experiences um, to prepare for the spiritual world. And that was probably very new for them to hear, but I just felt like, you know, we were there and I just wanted to say something to them. Um, and one of the ladies thanked me for that. Uh, I talked about, um, you know, the importance of marriage. It's all part of God's design. So I think that's everything I wanted to say. I did not wear my glasses so that Ambrose would see that maybe I'm not so smart after all, but I can kind of barely read my notes. Anyway, it was great. Um, convention comes up in June. You can be a you know retail or wholesale member. Anyone that wants to go, it's in Salt Lake City. Latter part of June, I guess. And uh, anyway, as always, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I took notes on some other things also, but this was the main thing. Thanks very much, and I'll talk to you later. Bye bye.